Good evening, and at the beginning of a new series, our thoughts go out to the new Australian version of this show, uh, which will differ from ours, apparently, because according to its presenter, Paul McDermott, the English have an established class system, and their show's humour relies more on inbreeding lists and landed gentry. <laughs> Absolute rubbish, of course, as the cover of the Radio Times will testify. <laughs> In the news this week, uh, Labour Party spin doctors introduced their own preferred candidate for Mayor of London. <laughs> Geoffrey Archer makes light of the storm damage to his Thameside home. <laughs> and in Bristol, the fire brigade marks Britain's longest serving fireman's last day on duty with a light hearted prank. <laughs> Ian Hislop's team is a comedian who's discovered a mathematically flawless method of making money out of the National Lottery. He presents it every week. Patrick Keelty. <laughs> and with Paul Merton tonight is the former creative director of the Millennium Dome, although officials have denied that his resignation has delayed the schedule at all, saying that it's still on course for February the 21st, 2003. <laughs> Stephen Bailey. So, things can only get better, uh, obviously, as we haven't started yet. Uh, two bits of news in celluloid form, Ian and Patrick. The dawn of a new era. Bertie and Tony discussing hairstyles. <laughs> These are some nice men coming out to see the people of Northern Ireland. <laughs> to say hello. And there he is, the King of Ulster himself. And what's that? That's Mardi Gras and St. Patrick's <laughs> David Trimble has apparently annoyed Ian Paisley for, for selling out the union and Paisley thinks that, that Northern Ireland is going to be given back and apparently Richard and Judy are really pissed off about it as well because Fred the weatherman will have nowhere to jump. <laughs> and, it's, it, um, and then Bill Clinton is going to tie the whole thing up and come over and sort it out because he's got a lot in common with the people of Northern Ireland because 69 was the start of our troubles as well. <laughs> So, so there's peace in Ireland, apparently. Mm. Do, does the word yes appear? No! <laughs> no! <laughs> yes, and Blair's now been tipped, of course, for... The Nobel Peace Prize? The Nobel Peace Prize, yes, obviously. Um, I, think, I think they'd better give it a week or two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last Friday, Tony Blair arrived in Belfast saying, this is not a time for sound bites. I feel the hand of history upon our shoulders. <laughs> The Mirror sought the opinion of uh, key players in the talks, such as Eamon Holmes, Sinead O'Connor and Gloria Honeyford. Uh, Gloria was ecstatic. You have to live in Northern Ireland to understand. It can be a blissful place and the people are full of fun, she said, speaking from her home in Kent. <laughs> so, uh, Paul and Stephen. This is the uh, National Lottery, I think. Uh, those are stamps, obviously. Um, I think I know exactly what this is. I mean, the, the post office, having made such a significant success of uh, making a lottery of mail deliveries, is now making a... <laughs> wants to make a bid for running the lottery itself. They're supposed to be linking up with Littlewoods. Oh. Um, so, you, you, so you can get a nighty as well. <laughs> <laughs> I was Littlewoods pools, actually. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the same company, I don't know. It is the same company. It is the same company. Um, yeah. So that's why you had Branson there, because he's been cut out of the deal. Well, no, for, other, for another reason. Branson was in the news this week. Because he's amusing, he's got a funny beard. <laughs> is Nothing it? wrong with funny beards. <laughs> well, this is, this, my mind is just... <laughs> you know, this is, there's, there's, a, there's a profound poetic difference between a, a beard and not shaving. This is not shaving. Oh, is it? And I felt, yeah, I felt I had to sort of confirm prejudices about designers and, you know, and be here with a certain amount of stubble. So that's designer sort of, stubble? Sort of, yeah. But it's also, it's also to conceal my true identity. <laughs> what? Your true identity being... <laughs> Anita Harris! <laughs> How is I it just think it's very bad news for Postman Pat. <laughs> it's totally <laughs> redefined his duties, it's sort of going around Greendale and selling scratch cards to those underage kids. Well, if the post office took it over, you wouldn't have scratch cards, you'd have lick cards. <laughs> <laughs> and if you lick three queens, then you host a show like I do. <laughs>
<laughs> well, that, that's the way it apparently works in yeah. the BBC. So, um, what happened <laughs> yeah, the other so week then, when the uh, studio audience is supposed to have walked out of, of your show? Is it? Uh, no, actually, it was a recording break, and people went for a piss, and then someone went, "Oh, get a snap of that!" And so that's how they do it. I suppose yours is the official line, is it? Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah. there you have it. So the audience was bored and left, or they were all going to the toilet. <laughs> How come you pre-record it, then, in advance? <laughs> that's, the, that's the only way you can pre-record something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, it is the news that the... Uh, you're standing by Anthea, which is very good of you, I think. <laughs> it's, uh, it is the news that the post office are uh, hoping to take over the running of uh, the lottery. The plan has the support of Richard Branson, who recently won a libel case against a former Camelot director. Uh, during the trial, Branson was given permission to leave the court to circumnavigate the world by balloon, and he returned half an hour later with a bruise on his forehead. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, the big ticket lottery show is facing a crisis after uh, half the studio audience walked out during a recording. Oh, Anthea Turner really? uh, apparently <laughs> turned to the audience and said, Where do you think you're going? A line she's used more than once this week. <laughs> oh, you smug, cruel man. Uh, <laughs> so, at the end of round one, uh, the scores uh, should be two all. Uh, which indeed they are, uh, all things being equal. Uh, so to all it is, and so they are. <laughs> so as the storm clouds gather for round two, the freak ray of sunshine that is our caption competition, Ian and Patrick have this to inspire them. <laughs> Paul and Stephen get this. Uh, and we'll be back for their captions uh, before the end of the show. Uh, or after the end of the show, if we forget. <laughs> uh, round two is our odd one out. Paul, your uh, beautiful people are David Schwimmer, Monica Lewinsky, Nicholas Cage, and George Michael. <laughs> um, give us a clue. They've all uh, been on Give Us a Clue. <laughs> uh, location of said incident. Oh, the Will Rogers Memorial Park. Or a public toilet. Is it the public toilet or is it the Will Rogers Memorial Park? It's a good I... name for a park full of people doing things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, George, George Michael, who apparently is doing a duet with hot chocolate, it started with a piss. <laughs> Some papers said he was convicted, he was on his own, and he was, and he was engaged in a homosexual act on his own. <laughs> He's been blessed by nature. <laughs> what was George's angle? What was his what? About 37 degrees. Yeah, thank you. He said he wasn't ashamed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there you are. <laughs> he wouldn't, nobody would be ashamed, would they? Um, what, what he uses it as a draft excluder in the winter. <laughs> They're not going to get this, are they? <laughs> um, it is that they all went to Beverly Hills High, uh, except George Michael, who, as we indeed know, uh, went to Bushy Hill Comprehensive. Uh, asked to comment on George Michael's arrest in Beverly Hills Toilet, uh, his old partner in Wham, Andrew Ridgely, told reporters, <laughs> I have no contribution to make. <laughs> <laughs> Just like old times. <laughs> uh, uh, Stephen. <clears throat> Your slightly less beautiful people, Alan Titchmarsh, Robin Cook, <laughs> Rupert Allison, and Gavin Estler. Uh, who is Alan Titchmarsh? <laughs> he's a champion gardener. Ah, and he's the know. Prime Minister. Oh. <laughs> I know who the other people are. I think the, um, I think the thing must be they all deserve, or probably all need alter egos, but the only one who's actually got an alter ego is, um, is Alison, who's also known as the, um, the spy writer Nigel West. He is. He is but he's not, that's is. not the answer. But that's no, not the answer. Wait, but Alison, didn't he sue this programme and lost? <laughs> that's true. Has that got anything to do with it? Uh, none whatsoever. No. <laughs> it's quite amusing, though. Although it, it is worth mentioning as often as possible. <laughs>
<laughs> why, why did he sue this programme? I can't remember. Uh, we suggested he could be referred to as a conniving little shit. <laughs> And, and he lost the case. <laughs> Fortunately, yes, otherwise we'd have to pay him all over again. <laughs> it is a literary question. Rupert Allison, uh, as you said, yeah. Nigel West writes yeah, the books. He's the only person who's written a book. Yes. He's written lots of Alan books. Alan Tishmarch well, has written a book, has he? He has. He has? Oh, well, yeah. Robin Cook hasn't written a book, so Gavin Esler must have written a book, so Robin Cook must be the odd one out. No! Oh! I'm going to give you one for that, because you've got the right person, but not quite the right reason. Uh, the answer is that they've all written a novel about their own profession, except Robin Cook, uh, whose recent affair, uh, Barbara Cartland, has decided is going to be the subject of her next novel. <laughs> a uh, radical departure, as it will be the first of her 600 books not to contain the words tall, dark and handsome. <laughs> I don't know. Gainer's quite tall, dark and handsome. <laughs> and how do you pronounce her surname? Gainer Regan, I think. No, Cook. <laughs> You've been saving that one up, haven't you? <laughs> Fell into it. Um, that's the first time I've thought of you as clever. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, won't last long, I assure you. Uh, Ian, your uh, mixed bag contains... Lord Irvin, oh, yes. Ken Hom, Marcel Dargy Smith, and Carol Smiley. <laughs> Stephen, Carol Smiley. Um, no. No? <laughs> no, no, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to help me with this one. <clears throat> Which one is Carol Smiley? She's the one smiling. Oh. <laughs> She's the one with the two smiles. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, Carol Smiley a presents a programme about interior decorating. Changing rooms. Changing rooms, it's mm. called. But what does she do like that? <laughs> <laughs> and how much is it? <laughs> <laughs> I've never asked her. Um, and you think you should? <laughs> Lord <laughs> Irvin is very keen on decorating. He's redecorated his house at, at our expense. At our expense. Flash right. um, new toilet, new wallpaper, all that type of stuff. Pugin mm -hmm. wallpaper. They're all very keen on wallpaper. Is this a wallpaper question? <laughs> it, it is a wallpaper question, but them being keen on it is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and you obviously don't know why Marcel was in the news last month. She had her film confiscated. Is she taken a photograph of Carol? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, she was taken round, wasn't she? She was taken around Lord Irvin's chambers to see this wallpaper, took a picture and had it confiscated. The answer is they've all been uh, allowed to see Lord Irvin's famous wallpaper, apart from Carol Smiley. Uh, although the BBC is working on a new show, Changing State Rooms, in which uh, an ordinary Lord Chancellor gets to transform the sitting room with only £650,000 of taxpayers' money and a key to the Tate Gallery. <laughs> Defending his choice of wallpaper, Lord Irvin said, we are not talking about some rubbish from a DIY store that might collapse after a year or so, at which point the builders winked at each other and quietly <laughs> slipped away. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, uh, a few years ago, Lord Irvin ran off with the wife of his now colleague, Donald Dewar, uh, but that's something that he insists doesn't warrant any further media attention. So, on to our next old one up, Patrick. Uh, Donald Dewar. <laughs> Lord Irvin. <laughs> Uh, Randy Brown <coughs> and Peter Powell. Ah, okay. <laughs> they, well, Peter Powell, split this way. Uh, Randy Brown. Um, which one? Which one's Randy? <laughs> uh, the one on it's the, the right is, is called Randy. Yes. Is yes. this the football coach, the American football coach, who told his team that if they won the next game, they could have a go with his wife? Not play football with his wife. <laughs> a shagger. <laughs> yes, you're in the right ballpark. Certainly. <laughs> yes. So, so hang on. Did the football team uh, do the business with his missus, and then he split from his missus? Uh, a clue is that Peter Powell's role, because he's not just. Uh, oh, he's the manager. He's her agent. Manager. Mm. Mm. Was um, Donald Dewar's wife his agent, his political agent, his no. manager? No. No. Um, is it I'm wallpaper? It's nothing to do with wallpaper. Uh, the answer is that they have all offered the services of their wives, uh, with the exception of Donald Dewar, who surrendered the services of his wife uh, to Lord Irvin, as I think we mentioned. 
Lord Irving has offered the services of his wife Alison, formerly Mrs. Dewar, as a tour guide to his newly refurbished state rooms. Uh, Donald Dewar and Lord Irving have put uh, behind them the embarrassment of old marital difficulties as they struggle to overcome the complex legal issues involved in Scottish devolution, and problems which are not helped by his lordship coming in late every morning and saying, God, I'm knackered, your old missus goes like a steam hammer, doesn't she? <laughs> Uh, which uh, brief glimpse at leaders' wives marks the end of this uh, particular spread, and the glad news is that uh, Paul and Stephen are the happier couple, leading as they do 3-2. <laughs> To mark the birth of a new series, the almost certain death of a new round, Cool Britannia is the name of the game, for which the BBC have lavishly splashed out on this coolometer. <laughs> uh, this will reveal a person or object. Uh, all our teams have to do is identify them and say whether, according to the dictates of uh, new labour, they're cool or otherwise. So, to your marks, as we spin the shield of cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what I think I know what this is. <laughs> this is the model for the for the gigantic figure in the Millennium Dome, which you know, I think part of the evidence of some of the Millennium Model is that, that no one can quite decide whether this figure should be male, female, or androgynous. But I think they called in this model to help decide. Uh, so I think she's probably cool. You're absolutely right. You refer to them as they. Of course, you were originally in charge of them. <laughs> <laughs> Millennium Model, as you put it. Um, were, you, were you for the big? statue? No, I didn't think it was a very good idea. I mean, I think it's, um, I think the big statue, it's, um, it's a sort of very lazy cliché. I mean, I think it's, you know, the, the parent and child motif is you know, sort of very familiar and a potent symbol in, you know, in Western art. We've got a, a photograph here of what it's going to look like. There you are. <laughs> is that vapid kitsch? Yeah, I think so. Well, it's not vapid. This, this particular bit may not be vapid kitsch. This is probably quite, you know, quite glorious, I mean, quite intense kitsch rather than vapid. I mean, dense kitsch, not vapid stuff. But, <laughs> but then, you know, kitsch, yeah. certainly. I think it's important to know this. I think, I think it's, it's these subtle distinctions. Mm. This is what makes civilization, I think. Because mm. mm. I, I want to know why you resigned. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, you, don't, you don't want to know now, do you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's got loads uh, of time. Yeah, yeah. I just felt, um, I felt I wasn't getting my way. <laughs> Am I right in thinking your suggestion for the contents of the dome was nothing? Well, my, yeah, that was the original suggestion. I think that's quite, there's, there's an element of seriousness about that, because it's, um, <laughs> the, the, the building... <laughs> How much were you getting paid? <laughs> 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 Let me put it this way, the building's absolutely magnificent and mm. you know, no one, people enjoy going to the Pantheon in Rome, which is also empty. What is the idea of this uh, enormous androgynous erection? <laughs> the, the large figure is mm. meant to represent the body. Do you get it? Yes. Uh, well, it was a body. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> no one's quite decided, I mean, people enter the body, no one's quite decided which orifice they use yet. Um, um, <laughs> it's about sliding doors. <laughs> Just like you get in the supermarket. <laughs> yes, it is uh, Naomi Crouch, is her name, uh, who is officially cool. Uh, she was uh, chosen to model for the enormous naked human body in the body zone of the dome. Uh, she said that although she had to take all her clothes off, they weren't particularly interested in what gender she was. It didn't matter if I was a man or a woman, they just needed a body. Well, we've all been that pissed once or twice. <laughs> Was, uh, it was decided that the body should be sexless because the idea of visitors wandering around giant female genitalia would have safety implications. All the men would bang their heads on the clitoris saying, Oh, what the bloody hell's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, cool or fool? a band called Chumbawamba. Do you know, did you, you realise that Chumbawamba is a contraction of Chimpeats Banana? Is it really? Hmm. That's that... fascinating. No wonder you were put in charge of the <laughs> <laughs> That man there is called Dan But No Bacon. He was originally called Nigel. <laughs> I suspect he's an authentic genius. Do you? Hmm. 
Well, well, that's an interesting view. <laughs> on, on, on what what actually, I've, I've, I've never met him. Let me you know, issue an invitation to him through this, you know, through this medium. That if you'd like to get in touch, I'd, I'd, I'd love to. You know, I think it's not a dating agent. Would <laughs> 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 be a topical quiz show. <laughs> This is a Chumbawamba, and they're definitely not cool because right. they tipped water all over John Prescott's home. Uh, <laughs> yes, you're right. They're, anyway, they're, he was not cool. Um, not cool. Mr. No Bacon was uh, cast out of uh, New Labour's Cool Britannia Club after he leapt on a table at the Brit Awards and uh, threw a bucket of cold water over John Prescott. Mr. Prescott apparently woke up with a start and said, Is Alma Cogan on yet? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, finally, let's go for another spin. Uh, we not only have the photograph, but we also they, have the they, real thing. They suit you. Thank it's, you. Um, no, I can tell you exactly. I, mean, I, I said I really did have a hand. Oh uh, yes, this, this is. is no, I know this. this is 18th century. It's French. <laughs> <laughs> is it some sort of pipe cleaner used by Louis the Fifteenth? No, I know exactly. It's a Millennium product. Is it? Yeah, it, it's um, the, it's part of the thing chosen by the list of a uh, few hundred things chosen by the Design Council as an as an explanation of authentic British genius. What this is, this is a cow slipper. <laughs> and you chose that? Yeah. You should have seen, you should have seen the things we rejected. <laughs> <laughs> if, what, so is it cows in the home in yeah. front of the television? <laughs> 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 putting their feet up. Why would cows need slippers? No, no, an alarming number of cows have bad feet. Do they? Which affects their productivity. <laughs> Do they have bad taste as well? <laughs> <laughs> do, do they have to go for a fitting? Or do they all have the same hoof size? <laughs> do you know why they have bad feet? The cause of it. Uh, it comes from standing in fields. <laughs> <laughs> Which you would think is a bit of an occupational hazard. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> <clears throat> so what were some of the other Millennium uh, products? My favourite was a dredger. The other thing, there was some. Um, there, there, there was another. There was another. Like Mr. No, Bur no Bacon, there was another genius who's had a Millennium product selected, and it was it was this. It's a duvet cover, for which op opens on two sides, so it's much 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 easier to fill. Isn't that wonderful? Have you ever thought? <laughs> Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> little things, you know. Little it things. Is no wonder it? Britain's so successful economically. <laughs> This uh, orthopaedic shoe for cows uh, has uh, recently been given a Prince Philip Design Award, <laughs> presumably because it makes them easier to shoot. <laughs> the, uh, the company Giltspur Scientific uh, have made millions fitting the uh, special shoes onto cows, although not as much as they've made from selling them scuff protection cream and suede cleaner at the same time. <laughs> Which uh, insane rantings mark the end of this cool spell uh, with uh, Paul and Stephen, uh, currently looking the hipper of the four dudes. Uh, being ahead 7 6. The words final round have never sounded so welcoming. A liberal <laughs> sprinkling of half baked headlines, including many or none from this week's guest publication, the remarkable P and Bean Progress. <laughs> oh, they've <merged. laughs> What happens to Marafat Weekly? Is that just been... <laughs> is that it's, folded? It's folded. <coughs> folded. Died. Yeah. So, to your marks, for 11 ton steak pie gets what? Pride of place in Millennium Dome. <laughs> Cold shoulder is how it put it. Oh. Because yeah. it arrived frozen, you see. It contained 12,000 pounds of British beef, apparently, the steak pie. And John Gummer's daughter ate the lot. <laughs> Next, uh, what blamed for uh, fire in Monkey House? Uh, Mickey Dolenz. <laughs> <laughs> Chip pan. Um, <laughs> they were frying chips late at night. <laughs> Arsonists is the answer. <laughs> they always get blamed for fires, don't they? <laughs> um, this was uh, a fire in a cage containing five sake monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you looking at? <laughs> Next, butterfly set to devastate what? It's a reference to chaos theory, isn't it? That idea that a butterfly flaps its wings in Sumatra and Europe becomes destroyed by a tidal wave. No? It's quite a lot of words to fit in the space. <laughs> <laughs> it is, in fact, geraniums, although I'm sure it's a veiled reference to the chaos theory. Um, <laughs> 
This is a geranium bronze butterfly, which is a native of South Africa, but in 1981 was accidentally introduced to Mallorca. The giddy social life they have these days. <laughs> and uh, next, what had Rocket Warhead? Oh, I know this. This is a, this is a Los Angeles housewife. Wasn't it? Uh, I think she didn't. 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 No, but I didn't. As soon as did she get? Was, wasn't somebody stopped getting on an aeroplane with a surface-to-air missile? Isn't? Eh? Is the Is right it? answer? Yeah. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> This is the Los Angeles housewife who was arrested for possession of uh, a missile pad, a warhead, and four rocket launchers. <laughs> uh, she has three children, but her husband is currently missing, uh, <laughs> presumed in orbit. Um, and finally, enormous what in pants? P. 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 No. This is another George Michael story. <laughs> beans. Nothing to do with uh, peas or beans. Ooh. Steak pie. Uh, uh, enormous hole. <coughs> no, it is in fact. Enormous explosion in pants. <laughs> uh, according to the sun, uh, this is explosion in the sale of pants. It should be, but obviously that wouldn't sound like someone shitting themselves. So. <laughs> uh, all of which uh, cock and ball marks the end of tonight's stampede, and I'm charged to tell you that this week's bum steers are uh, Ian and Patrick with six, while this week's holy cows are Paul and Stephen with twelve. Great. So, to our winners, a walk in the park with George Michael, uh, a chance to correct that typing error, to our losers. <laughs> but, uh, but before we uh, literally disappear, the bumptious intrusion of our caption competition, Ian and Patrick, uh, this was yours. She's a big girl, Boris, but I'll give her a go. <laughs> Paul and Stephen, what do you think of this? Nothing. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody can come up with a funny caption for this. I think it's beyond a funny caption. Have you got a funny caption, Angus, that you can put for this? <laughs> Have you eaten at a harvester before? <laughs> On which uh, uplifting note, we say uh, thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Patrick Keelty, uh, Paul Merton and Stephen Bailey. And I leave you with news that in Geneva, hopes fade as Saddam Hussein arrives for a UN peace conference. <laughs> <laughs> Palace sources are saddened that someone has been writing abuse in the Princess Diana Book of Condolence. <laughs> and there's a surprise for George Michael as the lights go on in a public toilet. Good night. <laughs>